Now you know it's about that time we talk about Halls of Valor with a complete mythic plus guide for it so you have an easier time completing all of your keys. Now listen, this is a long dungeon with a lot of abilities and I'm pretty sure you're gonna find out here a couple of nice little things you didn't know about. Like what to interrupt, what to dodge, secret routes and how to pack up mobs and stuff like that. So be sure to watch until the end because it's a juicy one. And by the way, all of these mythic plus guides are made 100% with the support of our Patreon. So if you enjoyed these, maybe check the link in the description, check our Patreon, see if there's anything you like over there. It's supporting this type of content and it's a win-win. You're gonna get custom wallpapers, access to bloopers and Patreon monthly chats and uh, podcasting coming soon on Patreon as well. So yeah, thank you Patreons for making all of this possible. We love you. Now let's get into it. There are so many route possibilities here, you can pick and choose where you want to go. The route we like to do is this one, and it is linked in the description below, but do not worry, for we shall go through all the abilities from all the trash and bosses in here, so buckle up, it's a big one this time. Volajar champions damage your tank with their power attack. They don't do much else, but when you have a pack with a couple of them, beware. Valajar thundercolors cast thunderous bolt, an interruptible cast which deals single target damage, and thunderstrike an AoE circle around the player which will deal damage upon expiration and place a dot on the player and everyone else within their circle, so move out of this. The storm drake does dragon things, like a frontal cone, lightning breath aimed at the tank, so tank him facing away from your group, and a crackling storm spawning a vortex near a player and inflicting nature damage to all players near it, so move away from it. The vortex will travel around for a little bit, but not too far from its initial spawn point. If you plan on pulling all of these together, make sure your tank rotates defensives, kites them out and your entire party uses slow stuns roots to allow the tank to kite them a bit. The first boss is probably also the easiest one in the dungeon. He has a couple of attacks and most of them are dodgeable, so let's go through them. First off, he does a dancing blade, which is generally aimed at a ranged player. This will throw a weapon on the floor, which will whirl around and deal damage to everyone in it, so dodge the swirly and the weapon that takes its place. These stay on the floor for a while, so it's best if you can bait them out of the way to keep a clear room for later on. A good place to position them is on the edges between the pillars. Next, he will cast Horn of Valor, calling forth his tricks to help him in the fight. This attack does AoE physical damage to all players when the cast finishes, and summons one drake at a time to fill up one third of the room with their storm breath cast, creating a static field in their path inflicting nature damage to anyone who stands in it, and tornadoes ball lightning, again damaging anyone who touches them. Treat this like the floor is lava and find the safe spot. You can see which drakes are going to come first and what area will be dangerous. We usually call the first two drakes to know which direction the tank should move the boss to. Once the first drake passes and the area gets cleared, that will be the safe spot for the next two drake attacks. The best way to tank this before the Horn of Valor cast is somewhere near the pillars, so you can easily swap between two zones. His third attack is Bloodletting Sweep, dealing physical damage to the tank and placing a dot on them, so use defensives for it. After Himdall deems you a worthy warrior, he will open up the way towards the rest of the dungeon and you can take two ways going up forward. The right side pack has two champions and a mystic, and the left side pack has a champion, a thundercolor and a rune carver. Between the two packs there is a sentinel patrol, which we will skip for now and discuss later on, when we find some more of his friends. So, here, in a lower key, it doesn't really matter which way you go as long as you keep the casters interrupted so they follow you up the stairs, just pick whatever side the sentinel is not currently patrolling. You can also use a shroud here or in viskips if you like. For keys around 15 plus, I prefer going left so that the group doesn't have to deal with the heal from the mystic just yet, but let's discuss what they all do. So. 
The mystic from the right side pack does a rune of healing, dropping this on the floor and all the mobs inside it will get healed for 5% of their max HP every 2 seconds, so make sure to kite them out of the runes, always. You can also interrupt or stun the cast. Holy Radiance is their most important spell which needs to be interrupted, otherwise it will heal all their nearby allies by 30% of their max HP, which is obviously very, very bad. Even though the dungeon is very long, its timer is pretty tight, so you should try to pull the packs as efficiently as possible and cleave things down together where you can, so a large AoE heal going through is pretty bad. Now for the left side pack, we already discussed the Thunder Collar and the Champion, let's find out more about the Rune Carvers. These cast Shattered Rune, placing a rune under the players dealing shadow damage and etch, an interruptible cast which is then a channel, dealing shadow damage to a player for 6 seconds. It's pretty important to interrupt this, especially in fortified weeks or high keys. If you pull this pack upstairs to the next 4 mobs, you will also find a Shield Maiden there. They cast Mortal Hue, a frontal cleave attack which deals physical damage to anyone in front of them and places a debuff on them which reduces healing by 20% for 10 seconds. This will very often kill your silly melees who are not watching their positioning, and more often than not, your windwalkers who will seem confused and cry about their skyridge spell. Rest in peace. Be careful with this when you want to clear your thundering affix as well. Their other attack is Breach Armor, a tank buster dealing a lot of physical damage on your tank and reducing their armor by 10%. This is also a stackable debuff, so make sure you don't pull too many shield maidens together or if you do, kite them around to drop your debuffs. If you pull big here, rotate AoE CCs like Incap Roar, Leg Sweep, Slows and so on. Going into the heart of revelry, there are packs and mobs left and right and front and patrols and oh no, what are we gonna do? Well, you do whatever order and packs you like. However, for our route today, we will ignore the patrolling sentinel some more, we'll get to it later, I promise. We will also leave the middle pack alone for now and we will pull the left and right side packs and line of sight them here in the back where we came from in order to stack them all up nicely for AoE. Make sure everyone line of sights. You can pick which boss you want to go next, either Herja or Fenrir, but most groups go for Herja first so let's not confuse people and go that way. You also kinda want the speed buff after Fenrir since it's a longer run back. We will continue by hugging the wall and pulling the next pack together with the two shield maidens in the next room and cleaving them all down together. The next pack we encounter up the stairs has a Volajar purifier. We recommend that one of your ranged players interrupt it so it comes down and you can cleave it together with the two shield maidens in the pack. He often casts Cleansing Flames, launching a barrage of holy bolts at its target location until he is interrupted. The bolts deal AoE damage to whoever gets caught in them, so make sure you don't kite them over melees. The next pack has a new mob yet again, a Volajar Aspirant. These mobs will do Valkyra's advance, leaping to a target in range and dealing AoE damage to anyone caught in the impact. The good news? You can LOS this easily at the stairs and completely negate this attack if your tank positions the pack well. They also cast Blast of Light, a frontal attack pointed at the tank, which your party needs to dodge. Next, you will have to deal with two mini bosses in order to spawn the next boss, and their combined abilities pretty much teach you how to deal with the next boss. You can pull them separately and deal with each one at a time, or they can be pulled together. If you desync their abilities, so pull the second after Eye of the Storm starts and definitely let your party know in advance. Be very careful on fortified weeks and maybe bloodlust here. If it's tyrannical, definitely bloodlust the boss instead. So, the left side mini boss, Solston, does Arching Bolt, an arc of lightning that leaps between targets and deals nature damage. More importantly, he casts Eye of the Storm, creating a protective bubble which you should enter to shield you from the storm outside. The lightning storm will deal very, very heavy AoE damage to all players and the bubble will reduce this by 75%. This also has a huge range, so if you have some players running back after they died, they'll just die on the way trying to get back to you. The other mini boss is Olmir the Enlightened, 
and he does a searing light cast dealing holy damage to the target. Luckily, this is interruptible. He also casts Sanctify, a long channel which spawns orbs of light traveling from him outwards in all directions. Make sure to dodge them, they are also coming out in a specific pattern, so if your melees learn it, they can easily continue DPSing while dodging. The pattern is 2 orbs, which you can dodge left, then 3 orbs, go left again, 2 more orbs, and so on. When the mini bosses are down, the next boss, Herja, will come down. There are two ways to deal with this boss, the normal way and the cheesy way. Let's discuss the normal way first as it is the easiest to do and it's less confusing for pucks. The cheesy way is also not needed at all if your healer is decent. So when she comes down she will receive a mystic empowerment buff while in range of the spirits of her mini bosses empowering her specific abilities. She gains their abilities once she reaches the arrowhead here on the floor. Mystic Empowerment Thunder empowers her while in range of Soulstone with Thunder powers, allowing her to cast Eye of the Storm and Arching Bolt and empowering her abilities by 10% for each 4 seconds she spends near the spirit. Mystic Empowerment Holy does pretty much the same thing but on the other side. It empowers her with Holy Energy, allowing her to cast Sanctify and Expel Light. The longer she stays near Olmir, the harder her abilities hit, so you want to keep moving her between the two empowerments so her stacks don't go too high up. So start her off on one of the sides. We generally start with the Thunder area and hide in the bubble when she casts Eye of the Storm. The entire party should pop a defensive ability for each of these casts and rotate them with AoE ones like Rally or AMZ. Healers, you need to plan the cooldowns you are going to use here. As a Resto Druid, Sunshade keeps her Convoke for each one of them, but you can also use Flourish and Tranquility for example. Tranquility is not strong enough on its own in Tyrannical Weeks, so make sure HOTs are running on all your party members before you pop it. This is just one example. When she is done with her channel, she will cast a Shield of Light on the tank which will push him back and deal a large amount of damage, so save a defensive for this and point her towards the other side of the room. Your party members should dodge this as well. Once she gets to the other side of the room, her thunder empowerment stacks start dropping and she gains the holy empowerment once. Here she will cast Expel Light on a player, placing a light circle around them which will explode after a few seconds and deal damage to anyone inside it. Next she will cast Sanctify. Make sure to dodge all the orbs coming out, the further you are, the easier it is to dodge and you may even find a safe spot from all of them sometimes. The melee should pay attention to the pattern and in case you have the thundering buff, make sure to clear it a bit early and not hoard damage until the last second and get people killed for it. She will do another shield of light after this and you should take her to the thunder side once again. Usually there is one remaining expel light happening as the lightning storm starts, so make room for all your friends to be safe inside. You can place the expel light on one side of the safe area while the rest of your party is stacked on the opposite side. This is pretty much the whole fight. Now let's talk about the cheese tactic. This is more easily doable if you have either a warlock, a priest, an evoker or a tank who can leap in your group, otherwise you may be too slow to do it, even with speed buffs. And even then, it can bug out and fail the key for you. What you want to do for this is to start her off at the edge of the holy empowerment on the arrowhead around the green marker and wait for seconds until she gains the holy abilities. Then leap quickly to the other side of the room on blue and have her do her sanctify on the thunder area. This will do much less damage because her stacks will be very low. Use her shield of light to get pushed back to the holy area where she will do an eye of the storm but not empowered. Keep doing the fight as usual but with all the abilities on the opposite side. So basically all you need to do is to start her off on one of the sides and quickly have her move out of there before she starts casting her abilities at 4 seconds. It may be possible to be done with other tanks if you start moving slightly earlier but we haven't really tested this successfully. Also this tactic can backfire badly if your tank is too slow at the start and she ends up being in the middle of the room taking both empowerments like this. Very, very bad. 
In our try here, we had the leap of fate timed well and the boss with the correct debuff, but then she decided to do a shield of light out of the blue, gaining her stacks from both sides, failing the mechanic. Once she's down, go back through the heart of revelry where you came from and clear some more trash here on your way to Fenrir, the next boss. The next pack we will clear for our route consists of known enemies. And a Valajar Marksman. We generally prefer to pull this trash into the tree area out here due to the Marksman leap to safety. You just have to deal with the tree affix here, okay? Leap to safety is a disengage which will reduce their damage taken by 25% for 6 seconds, but more importantly, they can leap into other trash bags you may not want to pull, so get them in a safe corner somewhere and be careful on Sanguine Weeks. They will also cast a snapshot for large amounts of physical damage and a penetrating shot, dealing physical damage to all players in front of them in a 45 yard line and ignoring all armor, so make sure to not stand in front of them or just keep them stunned. Once the pack is dead, go through the portal into the next area, the fields of the eternal hunt. First thing you encounter here are a bunch of stacks and a drake flying down to attack you. You can either skip the drake through the right side and invis or shroud on the way back, or just kill him by himself. We saw some groups using the drake to kill off stacks as they just one shot those, but we consider this is not to be worth it as the stacks barely give any percentage and the drake gains a stacking buff for every stack it kills, increasing his damage done and max health by 10%. You can clear some trash here until your bloodlust is ready for the boss if you choose to use it here. Bulls have two abilities to look out for, piercing horns, dealing a big chunk of physical damage to the tank, and rumbling stomp. An AoE swirly which deals damage and knocks players in the air if they stand in it, so dodge it. They also enrage on 40% HP. If you decide to not clear any of these here, you can sap one on your way back out and skip it that way. Or some groups choose to pull it and go through the portal as it will clip it to you in the next room. The Steel Jaw Grizzly, or by their easier name, Bears, <laughs> charge players, they do rending claws dealing large amounts of physical damage and crunch armor on the tank, a big, stackable debuff that increases their damage taken by 10%. The tank should pop big defensives or kite to drop the debuffs, and not let them stack too high. Use any slows or stuns you have available for a pack of these mobs. The Volajar Trappers have a quick chop attack dealing physical damage to the target, and they also throw bear traps near players, which you will need to dodge unless you want to get stunned for 3 seconds and get a nasty debuff. You can skip this pack before the boss if you want by walking between the tree and the rocks. The last mobs we want to discuss here are the Ebon Claw Works, which you will most likely pull in between the two phases of the Fenrir encounter, but let's discuss their abilities first. They do a ferocious bite attack, dealing physical damage to the target and more importantly they have a leap of the throat attack, where they leap onto a player in range and deal splash physical damage to anyone nearby. In order to deal with this attack, you can either use stuns, freezes, vortexes under them, you can place a ring of peace between them and your ranged players, or you can simply go to this fence here on the right side, have all your party jump on the pole at the purple marker, and make sure your feet are up, and then your tank can go gather a large pack up and bring them back to the rest of the group, so you can all cleave them down nicely. They will not leap your DPS and healer if they are well stacked on the pole. They need to be tanked closely next to the pole so that melees can also attack. Of course, this tactic doesn't work in all the affixes, like quaking for example. Either way, we recommend not pulling too many packs of these together as they buff each other with the strength of the pack and this is a stackable buff, so 5 works for buffs. Things hurt. As you start the boss, he will do a ravenous leap, jumping to mark players, dealing physical damage to all nearby targets and leaving a bleed on them. You can cancel this if you vanish, shadow melt, invis, feign death, etc. while he is mid-leap. 
This will also cancel the leap for the rest of your party members. He seems to go for the furthest player, so if you have a hunter or a mage in your party, they can easily be far and cancel the leap on everyone else as well. Either way, make sure you are spread out for this. Don't forget to stack quickly on the boss right after this, as he will also do a claw frenzy. This will deal a large amount of damage, physical-wise, split between all the players who are within his attack area. The frenzy ignores all armor, and if you forget to stack, you may kill some of your party members. If one of the players dies, this boss becomes insanely more difficult due to this attack alone. Unnerving Howl is another AoE attack which will silence your party members in the school of magic they happen to be casting at the time, so cancel your cast if this is going to interrupt you. At 60% HP, he runs away to his den and start leaking his wounds. During this time, you can clear some more trash and get your CDs back for the boss. In phase 2 of the fight, Fenrir also summons packmates when he does his unnerving howl. Leave them down quickly as they also empower each other with strength of the pack, just like the trash. You can also stun them, then freeze them in place to kill them off faster. In phase 2, he will also cast Scent of Blood, marking a player and fixating them. You will need to run like the wind and not let him catch you, but there are other ways to deal with this as well. You can leap a fed, rescue, gateway for slow players, just make sure to not grip them through the boss, but more easily, if you have the right tools, you can intervene or bop them, or some classes can use immunity or physical damage negation, they have like ice block or turtle or even evasion for rogues. Or if now none of that is available, just run like hell. In tyrannical weeks, you can use bloodlust in the second phase. When the boss dies, you will get a speed buff which will help you get back to the main area faster. Very often players still try to mount, but you should know, walking with the speed buff is much faster than mounted speed which negates it, so don't mount. Is it finally time to talk about those Stormforge Sentinel patrols? Yes it is! We left these for the specific point in the dungeon because the speed buff from killing both Herja and Fenrir will be super helpful here for the melees and the tank. The first thing you need to know about these sentinels is that they have sentinel swatch aura around them, which will grant immunity to stun and interrupt effects to any other trash mobs near them. This is why we don't pull them together with any other packs, so we leave them for the last so we can pull these pack of three together. Their other abilities are Crackle, a line of lightning inflicting damage to players who stand in it, so dodge it. Charged Pulse, creating a circle around them which will explode after a few seconds, dealing large amounts of nature damage and knocking back players, so dodge it. And at 30% HP, they will cast a protective light shield on themselves, which will absorb a large amount of damage. DPS through it or have it purged if you have the right classes for it. These mobs are not very hard, but they do take some time to kill if their charged pulse attack is desynced and your party is melee heavy. Once you cleared all the trash you wanted downstairs, you can grab a mug of beer from the tables and bring it with you up the ephemeral way if you want to kill more than one king at a time up here. If you have three mugs, you can cleave all four of them down at the same time, as the beer allows you to speak to them early. When you grab the mug, make sure you are not in combat and you will also not enter combat before you reach the kings, or you will lose the beer, so be super careful in spiteful weeks and don't pick it up too early. The buff only lasts for one minute, so grab it and RUN! Also, if other people get the trash upstairs faster and they talk to one of the kings before the beer is thrown, again, you enter combat and lose the buff. So ask them to be patient or just give up on the idea of in a pug group. Once you throw the beer, kite one of the kings you want to kill in front of the ones you threw the beer in order to get them to fight. Each of them has a unique ability and uh, when one dies, the other three will gain his ability, so you want to kill the easiest ones first so you don't end up with the stacking dot on the tank. We prefer to grab Ranulf and Bjorn together, then Thor and we leave Haldor for last. Easier to remember, left to right, King 1 and 3, then 4, then 2. Let's go through their abilities. Ranulf casts Unruly Yell. This deals party-wide damage, interrupts and silences players who are currently casting. Keep this ability interrupted. 
Bjorn casts Wicked Dagger, inflicting physical damage to a player and reducing any healing effects on them by 50% for 15 seconds. Thor casts Call Ancestor, which will fire a bolt of light in a random direction, which will spawn an honored ancestor, which will slowly start moving towards Thor or whichever of the kings summon him. If he reaches his target, he will be consumed by the king with ancestor's might, healing the king for 50% of his max HP. This can be very easily dealt with by either kiting the king away or rooting, snaring, slowing, trapping, blighting the ancestor. You can also kill him, but it's not really useful in any way and it just wastes time. The last king we want to pull, Haldor, does a sever attack. This deals heavy tank damage and increases all physical damage he takes by 20% for 12 seconds. While it is not really a problem with only one king casting this on the tank, if you have two of them casting it, it will continue stacking up and become increasingly difficult on your tank. This is also why we choose to pull this king last. Now, the reason we do that specific order, even if each of them only has one ability, is that when any of the kings die, the unique ability transfers to the other surviving kings, so the first one you will kill will have only one ability, the second one will have two, and the last one will have the combined powers of all four abilities. You can pull them in whichever order you wish, just make sure to deal well with their abilities. If you end up with a bunch of them calling ancestors, you will also need to kite quite a lot or use a lot of CCs. If you kill them one at a time, the last two kings will still both become active at the same time. When all four kings are dead, Odin will throw the Ages of Agrimar on the floor as a reward for defeating his champions. Pick up the shield in order to summon God King Skovald, the next boss. It's best if the tank or a melee picks it up, as it's easier for them to keep it in melee and protect everyone. Tanks seem to be super protective of this for some reason, but it isn't a tank thing at all, it's just convenient so that the race don't need to deal with it. You can continue attacking while channeling the shield, and you can turn around, but you are rooted in place. Once you claim the Aegis, Skovald will come and get offended that he didn't receive the Aegis even though he previously proved his word and challenges your party. His notable abilities are Fellblaze Rush. The boss places a circle around the party member and charges them, dealing fire damage and leaving a 12 second dot on any player caught in the circle when he charges. You can cheese this mechanic if you tank him in this corner here while your ranged line of sight on the green marker when the spell is cast on them. You need to have him pretty deep into the corner as the LOS is a bit iffy here, so you need to overdo it a bit. Also, sometimes the spell visually bugs and your player will have a green circle around them for the remainder of the dungeon. Savage Blade is a tank buster mechanic on which you should pop a defensive, and at 100 energy he will cast Ragnarok, a channel dealing large amounts of fire damage to your entire party and increasing by 25% for each new application. This is where the Aegis of Agrimar comes into play. When he starts casting Ragnarok, very important, when and not before, Activate the shield in melee, as it will absorb all incoming damage from in front of it, so make sure it's pointed at the boss. Be very careful to not turn the shield away from the people, you will kill them, and they start crying. If you want to min-max a bit, place the shield between the boss and your ranged players so that they have to move less in order to get safe. Anyone who is caught outside for too long is most likely going to die, especially towards the end of the channel. Immediately after Ragnarok, players should spread out as he will cast Fellblaze Brush again and if you're just hanging there, having a cup of tea, you're all gonna get clipped by it and then blame the healer, of course. After protecting your party against Ragnarok, you will drop the shield and Skovald will claim the Aegis as his own. He will start casting Aegis of Agrimar, only taking damage from inside or behind the shield and summon Flames of Woe. Elementals which move around the room, leaving pools of infernal flames in their path, so cleave them down quickly so you keep the room clean and don't step into the pools. The boss also throws patches of infernal flames at players, preferring ranged, but if everyone is stacked, he will have no problem slapping you there either.
After defeating Skovald, Odin comes down to challenge you as well, with the promise that your name will forever be carved in the holes of valor should you defeat him. You will need to talk to him after the roleplay in order to start the fight. Before the fight, we recommend placing markers on the floor, on the runes, like we did here, to make it easier on yourselves to find where you need to go later on in the fight, and as a general rule, learn where the runes are. The colors and symbols are always in the same position. Now, once he is pulled, we recommend tanking him where he stands and have your ranged players also be closely behind him in order to bait the spirits of light positioning and have an easier time dealing with them. As a general rule, always stay closely together in this fight. Spirit of light will create a swirly under a player's feet and a few seconds later this will explode, dealing damage and a spear will emerge from the swirly. Three glowing fragments will also come out of it and if you touch them they will deal damage and stun you for 3 seconds. So dodge, dodge, dodge. He does seem to prefer throwing spears at the ranged players by the way so beware. During the fight he also spawns a stoneforged obliterator which starts casting surge. This really needs to be interrupted. If you miss an interrupt, the next cast he does will be reduced by 100%, stacking up with each successful cast. On top of that, he also deals a lot of damage, so interrupt and kill this ad as fast as possible. You can also use CC on him, especially when you need to quickly get out of Radiant Tempest, a large UV circle you need to quickly get out of after Odin grips you in. Use speed to quickly dodge this and you can even charge the ad if it's close to the edge of the tempest. If the ad is out of range for melees to interrupt, make sure your range do so or you have some sort of CC like Ring of Peace to deal with it. Soon after the tempest, Odin will summon more spears of light so be on the edge to not spawn them in the middle and his cast will be followed by shatter spears, destroying all the existing spears and spawning 5 glowing fragments from each instead. Dodge these and quickly position yourself near the center of the area and definitely not in one of his runes, as his next cast is Runic Brand, where he activates the runes around the room and marks you with a color and symbol. This attack deals a lot of damage every second you are not in the right place and you won't survive for long if you don't find the correct rune fast. If you happen to run into the wrong rune, you will get hit by feedback and you are pretty much dead. In this instance, I had Dark Pack and Undenying Resolve popped and this is the damage it did on a plus 14 key. The runes are always placed in the same position, with the same color, so either learn the positioning, open your eyes or use a weak aura to help you get there faster. Use speed buffs, defensives, maybe even a rally. Once you reach the correct rune, you will lose the runic brand debuff and gain branded getting healed to full health, increasing your damage and healing done by 50% and your speed by 25%. This is the moment to pop your DPS cooldowns and bloodlust if you haven't used it on Skovald and try to nuke the boss down to 80% when the fight ends. Did you kill it? Congrats! Now loot your trinket and brag in your guild and get hated on by everybody. Now, but seriously, this is a very long dungeon with a lot of different trash and different abilities and I hope this is helpful because we tried to cover everything that is needed in order for you to have a smooth sailing ride. And hey, if you have any other tips, just lay it down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and these types of mythic plus guides, always let us know. I mean, it kind of like solidifies and confirms that we are doing the right thing here. And if you want to keep on seeing these in the future, maybe look at that Patreon, all right? All right, it's not required, but you know, it's worth mentioning from time to time, all right? Thank you for watching the video. Have a great day ahead and good luck on your Holes of Valor runs. Peace. I've been loving it then, I still love it now. Still, I play wild. Wow. Still, I play wild. Wow. Getting better every day, let me show you how. Cause still, I play wild. Wow. Still, I play wild. Wow. It's getting harder to stay, but at the end of the day, it's a guilty pleasure, so just log in and play. Whether it's classical retail, I'ma do a slash bow. Still, I play wild. Wow.